This episode is part of the transformational podcast Systems in Motion. If you want to learn more about the leverage points, please listen to the opening episode. Anton takes us on a journey through milk lakes and butter mountains to finally analyze the common agriculture policy, the CAP, an EU program to create rules for agriculture. In his podcast, we will find out what this is all about and what conclusions he comes to. Not too long ago in the US, something called government cheese became a cultural icon, popping up in jokes, in rap lyrics, on TV. It seems ridiculous, but it was actual cheese, huge bricks of it the government owned. So much cheese that they had to rent multiple caves to store it. So much cheese that in the early 80s, it was costing the government billions of dollars every year. The debacle of government cheese resulted from a seemingly simple agricultural policy with the promise of helping farmers. Commodity prices were set, so products like milk were produced, regardless of consumer demand, resulting in an excess supply. So the government stepped in and bought the surplus, which only reinforced the problem. This is a great example of a positive feedback loop. What happens when growth in a system leads to more and more growth? Of course, we can look back now and see so many ripple effects of this policy to culture, to public health, the economy. But one that can get overlooked is the environmental cost. I'm Anton Parisi. In this episode, that's what I want to look at. What are the effects of ag policy on the environment? Can the system be transformed to better conserve and protect wildlife and natural resources? And I'm going to shift focus away from the U.S. to Europe, where this podcast is being produced. Though I found out in making this episode, the EU had its own special version of something like the government cheese caves. This episode is called The Gap in the Cap. Farming in Europe is largely influenced by the Common Agricultural Policy, or CAP. The latest revision was just released with a budget of more than 380 billion euros for the next six years, which will go to subsidies for farms and rural development. For systems transformation, subsidies are used by Dr. Danella Meadows as an example of leverage point 12. Coincidentally, the weakest of the leverage points, numbers, constants, and parameters. But we know that the cap subsidies don't exist in isolation. They are one part of a complex system of interrelated factors. There's a book written for the European Commission, which looks at the cap related to a different leverage point, titled Reforming the Common Agricultural Policy, History of a Paradigm Change. And paradigms, according to Dr. Meadows, are the second most powerful leverage point. In her book, Thinking in Systems, in the chapter after she outlines leverage points, Dr. Meadows offers what she calls systems wisdoms. First bullet point on that list, get the beat of the system. And she says, examining history is a great way to do that. So it's fitting that the European Commission's book links history and paradigms. And for us, author Isabel Garçon shed some light on the system with her analysis, from which I will share a few points. She says, the cap chugged along, fairly unchanging, for its first few decades, starting in the 60s. But issues did pop up. Much like with government cheese in the US, the EU tried to stabilize prices by purchasing surplus, which was, Garçon writes, stored at the expense of the EU budget in beef mountains or milk lakes. Now, not only does this sound extremely unappetizing, but it was disastrously expensive. And budget wasn't the only problem. There were international trade disputes, the decline of small farms and of farmer incomes in Europe, and growing public concern for, among other things, the environment. So beginning in 1992, the CAP underwent a series of changes in which it took in public concerns. Its structure and goals were modified and expanded. A new category for rural development subsidies was carved out under what's called Pillar 2, while farmer payments fell under the new Pillar 1 and included more social and environmental incentives. The CAP's focus and framing shifted from production to public goods and services. This is a paradigm shift 
that Garçon names her book after. And here we can also start to see the power of paradigms. Because how we think about farming and how it's legislated comes from a larger worldview of what we believe it's for. These larger paradigms of ag in Europe influence the cap from the specific amounts to the big picture, the goals of the cap, and of farming itself across the continent. And environmental responsibility became one more expected role of the farmer in a paradigm she calls multifunctionality. That is, the purpose of the cap and of the farmer is not just to produce crops, but to take on many other roles in social and environmental realms. Since Garçon's book in 2006, the cap has been modified a bit, but the important question is, does a new paradigm, do new goals and structures and subsidies linking farms and the environment, do they actually deliver positive outcomes? While the increasing connection between ag and ecology has been institutionalized by policies like the cap and internalized by farmers, nevertheless, for years, scientists and policymakers have noted what's been called the implementation gap between the methods adopted on farms and society's environmental goals. Because the truth is that in Europe, as elsewhere, biodiversity has continued to decline and that greenhouse gas emissions have continued to rise. And we know that agriculture plays a huge part in this. To get a better understanding of the implementation gap, I took an unexpected journey which started with a paper in the journal Conservation Biology. The unexpected part was that it veered away from the physical sciences and borrowed a tool from behavioral science. This tool is the behavior change wheel. Its creators noted that a desired behavior is part of a system. So any intervention may come from a number of approaches and entry points in that system. The wheel structure gives us clues to how this works. At its core are the individual's sources of behavior, things like motivation. On the outer ring are the policy approaches, for example, legislation. And between the two lie the mechanism of those policies, which they call intervention functions, and include things like training and coercion. All the points on the wheel represent potential for implementing change. And I want to note that its creators use their glorious new wheel to analyze health interventions, specifically obesity and tobacco use. But this paper in conservation biology cunningly took the wheel and applied it to European farm policies, a move that Danella Meadows would undoubtedly support. It connects to another of her system's wisdoms, defy the disciplines. Looking at biodiversity, their study found that policies vastly over relied on education. They also found across the EU that education and other weaker interventions were overused, while more effective ones were underused or totally absent. In a different paper in the journal Biological Conservation, which is not to be confused with the Journal of Conservation Biology, I found its authors also seem to have a disproportionate emphasis on education. I guess that makes sense for the academic sphere. But I also appreciated one of the recommendations for closing the implementation gap, collaborative stakeholder groups. And while the authors didn't make strong links to policy, we could start to envision how the cap could incentivize such groups and press little on leverage point four, self-organization. Another paper notes that under pillar one payments, farmers choose environmental measures which are more productive and unfortunately not as beneficial to biodiversity. One of their proposals, echoed by NGOs like Greenpeace and NABU, is for stronger and more specific mandatory measures for those receiving funds. On the behavior change wheel, this would add to the underutilized intervention of restrictions. And for leverage points, connect to number five, rules. These papers and many others show us, like the leverage points, that there is a diversity of potential to implement change in the system. They also have added to the conversation in the months and years leading up to the new cap. And this latest month-old policy has been met with mixed response. In statements and articles from NGOs and the news media, some big takeaways are that the cap does have new greening incentives, such as for organic farming and rewetting peatlands. It also reserves 25% of Pillar 1's direct payments for environmental measures, 
35% under Pillar 2. But there has also been notable opposition, with concerns that policies were watered down, or important ones totally thrown out in negotiations. For example, the new cap lacks the call for 10% of ag space to be reserved for nature, a figure present in the EU's biodiversity strategy. On one hand, you have folks celebrating the cap and its connections to the European Green Deal, while the opposition claims it's mostly greenwashing. Like the academic papers, this diversity in opinion is part of the diverse stakeholder influence in cap negotiations. For me, this underscores Garcon's multifunctionality paradigm. So, given what we know about systems transformation, what can we predict about European agriculture's effect on the environment? Are the new reforms big enough to indicate a new paradigm? Can it be a driving force for positive change, or is the cap just a prisoner to bigger political and economic pressure? In Garçon's book, she opines that the history of cap reforms, which included environmentalism, were actually just a way for the EU to protect its international trade priorities, thinly justified as domestic environmental policy. The more powerful paradigm was actually an economic one. Maybe if we want the cap to be a tool for better environmental outcomes, we need to learn from the behavior change wheel and recognize the full diversity of interventions possible and understand behavior change not only of farmers, but of ourselves, because changing the cap to be more environmentally oriented requires a larger environmental paradigm which overpowers the economic one. Are the recent changes letting us know that we could be at the start of that shift? Or are we stuck with that less powerful leverage point of just rearranging the numbers? I, for one, look forward to finding out. This episode was produced in cooperation with Meet Studios.